Suzanne, thank you so much. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to 1 Samuel. Isn't that a beautiful phrase? If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Samuel 4. I asked this on Facebook through our account and also through email. And I asked this question. Our series on Wednesday nights is Our God Hears. We're going through the book of 1 Samuel. And we've been, we have looked at Samuel as a little boy. We've looked at his parents last week. And the week before, we looked at the depravity of the country itself, how Israel was not doing well. But tonight, uh, tonight's message is not for the lost. Tonight's message is for Calvary Baptist Church. It's for our faith family. And I cannot think of a better crowd to go over this than with you. Because usually people that come on Wednesday nights are the ones that... It's tougher to come on Wednesday nights. Go ahead and say it, Miss Karen. It is, right? Go ahead and say it. It is. But you, <laughs> but you guys are here for whatever reason it is. But God wants to speak to his church. And specifically, he wants to speak to Calvary Baptist Church. I really believe that tonight. So I've asked this question. What do you want to never be said of our church? And I've asked this to you guys. I had a lot of folks respond. I had some, folks, some friends of mine who go to church somewhere else, and they've given their two cents. And all of these things were said multiple times. And... And I do not want to, you to, to walk out of here thinking that if you said something different than what our topic is tonight, that it's wrong, because all, all these things are right, maybe except, except for one. <laughs> but a lot of people said, I, we don't want people to drive by CBC and say, that church is not a friendly church. Within seven minutes, the average person makes up his or her mind if they're coming back here, and they never hear the preacher preach. It's by how people contact them, or they loved on. Does, does somebody look them in the eye? Does somebody shake their hand? Does somebody show them where, where to go? That's why our ushers play such a huge, huge role. Yes, I'm talking about you, Bobby. Y'all play such a huge role here. Thank you, sir. And everybody else who sits by them back and helps out and warms people. That's why when we shake hands, it's so important to, to say who you are and ask folks who they are. Number two, we are hypocrites. <laughs> Can they say that of us? There are no hypocrites here. Afraid not, but we sure are trying to eliminate as many of, of those as we can. Sometimes, sometimes it's me. Number three, we only have a form of godliness. Ooh, somebody's been reading Apostle Paul there. Wouldn't it be a, sh a shame for people to come to Calvary Baptist Church and say, those people just pretend they know God? Oh, ooh, hope that's never said of us. We compromise truth. Are there any comp compromising churches out there today? Whew. May it never be said of us. Number five, we do not love people. We honor our facilities and programs over God. Can we fall in love with our buildings? No. We'll talk a little bit about, about that. We do not fear God. You know, the biggest problem with, in America today is that we do not fear God. And some of the biggest problems in churches is that they're not fearing God. Because... The, our biggest enemies are not the Soviet Union, excuse me, Russia. It's not North Korea and Iran. And it's not the drug dealer down the street. Our biggest nemesis is really God if we're living in sin. 
I'm already starting to preach. I got to stop. We have lost our first love. Woo! What a scathing rebuke Jesus gave to that church in Ephesus. We are not a changed people. Is it possible to come to church and not be changed? I'm afraid so. Reverend John, do you believe there were any lost people here Sunday? Do you believe that, that there were? Do you believe some people walked out lost? What about Christians who are carnal? Do you think they came in carnal and walked out that way? What was me? Now, this next one is not mine. It's from a friend of mine who lives in North Georgia. He says, I never want to be said of our church that we have Nancy Pelosi as a member. <laughs> I could not help myself. I'm sorry. That's pretty good. Am I saying I agree with that? <laughs> Number 11. Well, she did come here. We're going to preach her Jesus. How about that? Number 11. We do not teach or preach the Bible. And that's really all these things are connected to that. If we teach and preach the Word of God fully and faithfully and forcefully, all those other things will take care of themselves. I do believe that. Do you? Oh, my friend, you have your Bibles out. 1 Samuel chapter 4. I want to talk to you tonight about a battle that took place that's not in any world history textbook at Wayne County High School. And it's a battle that took place between the people of God, the Hebrews, the Israelites, and their arch nemesis during the times of the kingdom, the Philistines. And if you went and read, how many of you read your passage this week? Did anybody read 1 Samuel 4? Okay, I have a, a few. But because you did not read it, let, let me backtrack some. In chapter 4, Eli is still the priest over Israel. His two sons, who are not very good sons, they are leaders of the worship there. They go out, and Samuel is young. Sam, Samuel is either a young man or, or a teenage boy. The people of God fight against the Philistines, and they lose. And then they retrieve the Ark of the Covenant of God and bring that to the camp. And they go out and they fight the Philistines again, and guess what? They lose again. And news comes back of the defeat. Now let's start in verse 19. Screen, uh, verses are up on the screen. Now, his daughter-in-law, this is talking about Eli. When Eli's daughter-in-law, the wife of Phineas, he was one of the sons and a priest, she was pregnant. She was about to give birth. And when she heard the news that the ark of God was captured by the Philistines, that her father-in-law Eli and her husband Phineas were dead, she bowed and she gave birth, for her pains came upon her. Of course, a tough time to have a baby. Verse 20. And about the time of her death, she has given birth to a son and she's about to die. And by the time of her death, the women attending her said to her, Oh, do not be afraid, for you have borne a son. But the mother did not answer, and she did not pay attention. Oh, here's the key tonight, verses 21, 22. And she named the child Ichabod. And the name Ichabod means this, people. The glory has departed. Or the glory has gone into exile from Israel. Why? Because the ark of God has been captured and because her father-in-law and her husband had died. Verse 22, she said this, The glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God has been captured. That is one of the worst things I think you can say about a church. You can write Ichabod out there in front. And it reads this, The glory of God is gone. The glory of God is gone. Oh, I hope that's never said about CBC. The title of the message tonight, simply this, The Glory Has Departed. And I want to talk about three, I want to, I want to answer three questions, if I may tonight. The first question, and these should be on your handout. The first question is this, why did God's glory depart from his people? I mean, does God love his people? Yes. Is God powerful? Yes. Can God do anything he wants? Yes. Well, why is God walking away from his people? Hmm. I think there are several examples in the first few verses that you were supposed to read in the last couple of days that will tell you why God departed from his people. And listen, Calvary. I'm talking about Israel, but you can insert Calvary Baptist in there as well. Number one, Israel was comfortable. Whew, this message tonight, whew, I may not be around long, but I'm going to give it to you nonetheless. Israel was comfortable. Look at verse 1. 
Now Israel, this is after the word of Samuel came to all of Israel, verse 1. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines. And they had camped at Ebenezer, and the Philistines had camped at a place called Aphek. Now the ESV doesn't give us a great picture here. Really, the King James Version is really the best translation of this chapter. But the idea is that here's the people of God, Israelites, are living in their territory. And there's a nemesis, the Philistines, who are attacking them. If you know your Bible, you know that when Joshua and, and the children of Israel conquered the land of Canaan, that they did not conquer all the land that God set up before them. And God said, look, Joshua's about to die. He's an old man. Okay? As you expand, you should kick out all these foreigners that live in your, on your territory. But you know the story, Calvary. Did they kick out all these foreigners? No, they did not. The Philistines were allowed to stay because they were paying tribute to Israel. But notice they did not pay tribute or taxes long. They went from having to pay Israel taxes to being autonomous, which means they ruled themselves. They didn't have to, have to pay any more taxes. And then they went from not paying taxes to being autonomous to being slave masters over the people of God. Why? Because Israel was comfortable. She was not alone. She did not obey the word of the Lord. Paul writes about this in Galatians chapter 5, verse 9, that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, which means this. You can have one little bitty sin. You know what happens to that sin that's unconfessed? It blossoms. It rises to the top, and it perverts everything in sight. When a church lets one little sin in the door and does nothing about it, that sin multiplies. It gets worse and worse. That's why we're never compromise on the Word of God. Boy, I'm going to say it, Lord. I don't want to, but I'm going to say it. The Bible teaches in the New Testament that preachers are to be men. Sorry, girls. And there are churches who compromise and allow women to be pastors. And those first denominations that allow women to pastor, you know what they let in next? Homosexuals, transvestites. Well, what happened? They compromised the Word of God. They let one little thing in. Oh, this area, God didn't mean just that a man of one, with one wife. It could be women too. They took what was written in black and white and made it gray. And they've let in all types of hell in, in their churches. If you're upset with me, take it up with God. I'm just quote, quoting him. There can be no compromises on the Word of God. None. What is in black and white, we should never disagree with. But what's in gray, we should love each other. <laughs> All right? <laughs> not only was Israel not alone, Israel was on the defensive. Instead of expanding her territory, she was playing defense. She was content with the... I keep saying she. Israel's a he. He was allowing the land that he had when Joshua died, and that was good enough. They were satisfied with not God's best. When Israel stopped advancing like God told him to, they started to play defense. And Paul talks about the armor of God in the book of Ephesians. And how, many, how much of that armor is for defense? None. The armor is to attack and advance. Are we comfortable, church? Are we playing defense? Are we just reacting to the world and the culture? Or are we proactive? Oh, me is right. Is this on? Okay. How can Calvary be made comfortable? It's a good question, Terry. I've got a couple of things. How can our church become a comfortable church? You ready? Number one, we have no backbone. Number two, we have no vision. Number three, no evangelism. We're not concerned about souls. Number four, no challenges. No sweat, no toil, no tears. That's a comfortable church. Am I wrong or am I right? Calvary, do we care? Where are our tears? Where is our toil and sweat? Where are our sacrifices? 
Being challenged is not a lot of fun. But being a comfortable church is not either over time. This church can die when we become too comfortable. And give you this Wednesday crowd just a little snippet of what I want us to do at the end of, starting with the end of summer because all y'all people are going to and fro. <laughs> I'll be here though. I want Calvary to be a community church. I want us to go out and win the community for Jesus. And it's not my job to do it by myself. I need your help. You need me, I need you. And I have a vision for us to not just be here. Say, world, come into our building. They're not coming. We have to go out there. The vision I want for us is to be a community church. That means we're not going to watch as much television. Maybe not go off on as many trips. Maybe we have to come up here another time during the week than we're accustomed to. Will you join me? Will you join us in this vision to be a community church? I want you to pray about this. Lord, am I a comfortable person? Have the Lord God sift you. Pray about it. I'm praying for you. Will you pray with, with me? Our vision is to be a community church. More on that in time. Number two, Israel was casual. Look at verses two and three. The Philistines drew up in line against Israel, and when the battle spread, Israel was defeated before the Philistines. And the Philistines killed about 4,000 men on the field of battle. Verse three, and when the people came to camp, the elders of Israel said, why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh that it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. Do you read in verses 2 and 3 how the people feel towards God? They are taking God for granted. We lost. Why is the Lord upset with us? Hey, go get the ark and bring it here. Israel called on God as a last resort. Do we do that at times? Oh, are you kidding me? I love the King James Version. That's what it reads. Let us fetch the ark. You ever use that phrase or that term? Fetch. Let's fetch the ark. Hey, boys, go get the ark and bring it here. I did a word study on fetch in the King James translation. This is what I got. Bless my soul. It's the idea of needing something in a pinch, something that's quick. That's not planned for. I need it now. I need it now. Go, go, hurry, go. Fetch has the idea of something that is used and consumed. Something that's about you, in other words. It's satisfying a need you have. It's an idea of something that is temporary. They didn't care about the ark until they lost. And if they go out to battle and fight the Philistines with the ark and they win, hey, we don't need the ark anymore. Shove it back. It's something that's disposable. It's the idea of a demand from a superior to an inferior. That was all over the Old Testament. It was somebody in authority telling somebody else who was inferior, hey, go fetch me this or that. And they're talking about the Ark of the Covenant. God has become their inferior. Quick, fetch the Ark. Get God out. He'll help us. Can you preach and fetch? Oh, yeah. Can you teach Sunday school and fetch? Oh, yes, you can. Can you serve in committees and in Love Wayne projects? Can you fetch? Have the idea of fetching at then, too? It's called doing things in the flesh. Calling on God. God, oh, I'm on my way to church. Oh, fill me with the Spirit. May I say the things you want me to say? And you haven't called on God all week long. For honest with ourselves, every single person has fetched things from God before. And God does not come when you call, when you fetch him. Signs when we take God for granted. Are you ready? Lack of quiet time. Did you have a did you have quiet time today? If not, you're a fetcher. I need you, God. Ho hum attendance. Ho-hum expectation. 
Ho-hum passion. It's what Jesus called lukewarmness. How many ho-hum Christians do we have on Sunday mornings? More than you think we have. We take God for granted and we fetch God. You can also fetch God when you rely on past victories. <laughs> That's what they did. The ark went before them. They conquered Jericho and all these other cities in their land of Canaan. It, part, it led them to part the Jordan River. The ark became their power source. That's their victories was the ark. And they just fetched it. When your lifestyle is greasy grace, God will forgive me. I'm a Christian. Once saved, always saved. I can do whatever I want. God will forgive me. That mindset is all throughout the Southern Baptist Convention. <laughs> Until you face him, brother. Woo! That's a casual person who fetches the things of God, has that mindset. Number three, Israel was cheating on Psalm 78. And the screen is up there. Excuse me, the passage is up there on the, on the screen. And to forsake a time, you can go back. It's in, it's in, in the notes. God tells Israel, look, you went to battle with the Ark of the Covenant. You were coming from Shiloh where there was the tabernacle that Moses had erected and constructed in the wilderness. He said, I let the Ark of the Covenant go away. I let the, the tabernacle at Shiloh, even the whole community, be destroyed by the Philistines. Why? Because you were worshiping in the high places and you were an idolater. It's what the prophets call a whore. Sorry, that's in the Bible. They were a bunch of spiritual whores. And God said, you want me, you want to fetch me? And you're unfaithful to me in your worship? Forget about it. I don't know who you are anymore. Same thing in Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 12 through 14. It talks about that they were, these were people who had evil ways. Because they worshiped foreign gods. Israel was a cheater. Can we cheat God? Can we be unfaithful to our Lord? Is it possible in 2022, can't we? Anything you love, value, or honor more than God is an idol. And we talked about this a couple of months ago. I'm sure you remember every blessed word. <laughs> it could be possessions. It could be people. It could be your position, your pleasure. It could be your profession. We worship lots of things in America. Calvary, are we a bunch of cheaters? Is God first in our lives? Israel also was callous. Do you remember Hophni and Phinehas a few weeks ago? How terrible these men of the cloth were. Look in chapter 4, verse 4. They want the Ark of the Covenant to come as their good luck charm. Verse 4. So the people sent to Shiloh. That's where the corporate worship was. And they brought from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Armies, a host, who was enthroned on the cherubim. And the sons of Eli and Hophni, his name is Hophni and Phinehas, they were the ones there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. Here they are bringing, they're bringing the altar, I mean, excuse me, the Ark of the Covenant. And the two people who are bringing it are the two worst scoundrels in the whole country. They're terrible priests. They're unfaithful. They're lost. The Bible says they did not know the Lord. And here they are, the guard, they're guarding the gate. The presence of God, they're at the door. And the people know this, and they still look to them for leadership. Calvary, you are Bereans, I hope. You are to guard the gate. You are to be a watchdog. As your interim pastor, it's my job right now to be the visionary and to study the Word of God, but who's checking me? You should be. It's your body. You're the church. If any man says anything that's contrary to the Word of God, it's your job to call him out. And the people of Israel didn't do that. They said, oh, yeah, well, they've been doing it for all their whole lives. They are the sons of Eli. No wonder why they got beat. Israel was callous. They did not care about evil and this atrocity before the face of God. Before we get too pious, better check yourself, Southern Baptist Convention. We walk the same steps at times. We have to guard ourselves. I want to encourage you to be a watchdog, Calvary. You watch who's ever behind this desk, and you guard, you, watch, you listen to every blessed word, and you weigh it to the Scripture. Be Bereans. 
You're the watchdog. You cannot trust man because we're flawed. That's on me on me now. Come on now. <laughs> Last thing, Israel was conned. You know what conned means? We don't use that term a lot. Like a con man, confidence man. Con means that you are bewildered, that you have been tricked. Read verse 5. Here we go. And as soon as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel, what did they do, guys? They gave a mighty shout. Boy, they were so excited and emotional. And so the earth resounded. The earth shook because of so much noise. So much noise. You know, there's no greater deception than self-deception. It's one thing if I fool you to take $5. It's another thing if I fool myself and damn my soul to hell. That's far worse. And Israel, being carnal and being basically made up of a bunch of hypocrites, not only did they damn themselves, you know they damned the Philistines too. If you read this chapter, the Philistines thought like the Jews did. And they're both wrong. They're both going to hell because they did not trust the one true God. Several lies that Israel believed on or cons. Number one, power is more important than the presence. Power is more important than the presence of God. Oh, we love the gifts of God, but many of us simply do not love the giver. Come on now. True as a kid at Christmas. You know that's true. We like God blessing us, but we don't always want God around. That's Israel. Think about this, y'all. What role did the Ark of the Covenant have? On this slide here, it shows, I think this is the one that goes around, right? Right, John, John? Okay, good. You read in the Exodus account. The, the Ark was, was fashioned in Exodus 37. And then they would go off into the land of Canaan. They crossed the Jordan River. They went to Jericho. The Ark was one that they carried around the walls of Jericho. They took it to all these battle places. And they won, and the ark was associated with victory. And then once the conquests were done, now we go next, Johnny. Now the ark came to a rest at Shiloh for corporate worship. The people associated the ark with God's power and his strength. They forgot about the Lord. Because it's called the ark of the covenant, the ark of the testimony, the ark of the law. It's called also the ark of the Lord. And they forgot their Lord. What is the glory of God? They said it's the ark. What is the glory of, the, of God, people? You ready? It's his presence. That's the glory. It's God with us. God presided with his people before there ever was an ark. There's no ark today. Does God preside with his people today? You bet your bottom dollar he does. He presides with me. I don't know about you, Sam. I trust Jesus. One of my least favorite characters in the whole Bible is found in the hall of, of faith in Hebrews 11. You heard of the term the goat? G-O-A-T, greatest of all time. There's something called the zote, the zero of all time. I do not like Samson. I'm sorry, he drives me bananas. You read his account of Judges, what is wrong with that kid? And he's in the hall of faith. Which means there's luck for somebody like me. Judges 16, 20. Delilah has tested him in those crocodile tears, and he's told her the source of his strength. They cut the boy's hair. Samson, look! They're upon you! The Philistines are here! And read these words. He awoke from his sleep, just like Israel was in 1 Samuel 4. Are you ready? I will go out as at other times. And what did it read next? But he did not know that what? The Lord had left him. Oh, that's, that, that's a warning for us tonight. This is a message of challenge. It's also a message of warning. Is it possible that we, Calvary, can lean on the power of God rather than his presence? It is. Have you seen our budget over the last couple of years? Woo-hoo! Woo! Seven figures now. Whoa! God's blessing us. All these builders that are paid for in cash, 
And we want a couple more over here. Oh, what great facilities Calvary has. Calvary, you can, you can get any preacher, preacher you want. You know why? Because you have money, you have paid off buildings. And it's a lively church. This is a healthy church for the most part. You can get any preacher you want. Did you know that? Did you know that? Grace, go ahead and say yes, you did. You can get anybody you want because of that. But I hope you're not leaning on those things. I hope what's most important about Calvary is that God is here and he's working through his people. That's the power is his his person, his his presence. Not in what we have and what he's given us. Here's a question for you, CBC. If we decline in our attendance in this transition, if our giving dips, does that mean that God's presence has left us? Think carefully. Budgets and buildings does not guarantee God is presiding and pleased with us. Nor does the absence of those things mean that he's not with us. Sometimes there's addition by subtraction. That's another sermon for another day. (laughs) Number two con. Are y'all still with me here? All right, number two con. You ready? God can be kept in a box. We've all thought this. If you're honest with yourself, the ark is about two by two. It's shaped like a a little bitty coffin. It's it's small. It's what Joseph's bones were placed in. The ark really is not a, a... Necessarily a ship like we have out here off the coast of Georgia. It's more of a coffin. It's a big coffin that floated. Same thing with that Moses was put placed in on the Nile River. The Ark of the Covenant is a symbol of the death. Because the Ark is Jesus. And Jesus has died for our sins. Israel wanted to take God out of the box. When he needed God the most. And then place him back in the box when they were finished with him. Do we have God in a box here at CBC? When do we pray the most? When do we cry out to God the most? We do when we have money problems. When we have relationship issues. When our favorite candidate loses the election. When our kids make big mistakes. When the doctor gives us bad news. We get in trouble with our mouths. When the car won't crank. When the washing machine won't turn on right. When the job promotion comes open and is available. <laughs> oh, Lord, oh, Lord, I need you. That's a con job. We con ourselves. Number three, emotion can carry the day. Now, most of y'all in here are Georgia Bulldog fans, but I would say 90% of you love college football. Okay, there's about six of us. All right. Rest or asleep. The date, October the 8th, 1988, probably means nothing to you Georgia Bulldog fans, and it means nothing to me as well. Because there was a game in Baton Rouge that was played between LSU Tigers and the Auburn Tigers. And it was called, well, hold on a second. Less than two minutes ago, LSU's at home. They're on the Auburn 15. It's fourth down to 10. Less than two minutes ago, no timeouts. They're down six points. They need a touchdown. On 4th down and 10, their quarterback gets back and he rolls a little bit. He finds a guy in the middle of the end zone. And he catches that ball. And all those weirdos down there in the swamp go ape at one time. The name of the game is called the Earthquake Game. Because on the campus, a few blocks down from, from the stadium, they register earthquakes there. And they registered an earthquake that happened when the fans cheered when that guy scored that touchdown to beat Auburn. They celebrate it after the victory. Now, me personally, I want the earth to swallow up both those teams. That's just me. (laughs) But I'm telling you that emotion is a powerful and wonderful thing that God has given you. Emotion is a gift of the Lord. Did you know that? But it must be under control, though. And emotions can be deceiving. When I coach football... Now, in Hawkinsville, we, we, we're pretty good. Not because of the coaching staff. We had great players. All right? And we would play teams, and we would get warmed up, and across that mid, across the 50-yard line, the louder the team got, the more trash they spoke, the worse they were. That's my experiences there in sports. 
And Israel did the same thing. The ark comes. Oh, God's going to bless us. Woo! They're hooping and hollering. They're going ape. Even the Philistines come out of the tent and go, what's going on over there? The Bible reads that the earth shook because of their celebration, their emotions. But notice this. The enemy did not retreat because Israel got excited. Without the presence of God in this church, I don't care how passionate you are. It does not matter. You can have a preacher who moves around way too much, pounds the table and screams every now and again. But that passion is not the presence of God. Not necessarily. When we sing, oh, was, that, was the choir, hey, was the music not great Sunday? Come on now. And people stood up and cheered. That quartet. Certain songs that are sung, we all stand up at the same time. We know someone was going to hit that note. Glory to God. Are we truly worshiping? Is that the presence of God or are we more emotion, emotional? Come on now. Only God knows. <laughs> and I know I'm going to get a cheer on sun, Sunday. Do you know what I, all I have? All we have to say is one, one little thing. For Sunday school, we had three people. And for some reason in this church, people would applaud. When did that start? I'm just curious. Okay, I'm by myself now. All right. But y'all cheered no matter if it was three people in Sunday school or 300. What? At least somebody came from Sunday school. Yay! Not me, but yay! That's too close to home. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Can we rely on emotion as a church body? Yes, we can. That's dangerous. That's dangerous. We're conning ourselves if we think emotion carries us through. It does not. Now, we can use emotion, all right? We should be loud. We should be thank thankful. Don't get me wrong. But they're not, that, we're not leaning on that. Number four, God will protect his people at all cost. Israel assumed that the Lord would never let his people or his place down. But what do we find here? The people were defeated. They were later removed from the promised land. Shiloh, you don't read anything about Shiloh in the New Testament you know why? Because according to archaeological digs, after this battle, Shiloh was wiped off. There were, there were no more tabernacles. Excuse me, there was no more tabernacle. The society did not exist anymore. People left Shiloh, became in, inhabited. And the ark was removed. The Philistines took the ark. And here's a slideshow showing you what happened to the ark. Because while I'm on this ark, I want to go ahead and hit it. But the ark is captured by the Philistines. Go ahead, hit, hit John. Then it rests at Kerjath... Jerem, then it goes, David finally retrieves the ark, brings it back to Jerusalem, and then Solomon is in his temple. And then the next time we hear about the Ark of the Covenant is in 1980 at the Rama Theater in Winter Robins. We said the Raiders of the Lost Ark. We do not know where the ark is today. It could be destroyed. Somebody said it could be, God could have caught it up into heaven. We don't know. We don't know. That's how important the ark is to God. He doesn't need the ark. <laughs> he has himself. Why did God allow his people to be defeated? Why did God allow the ark to be taken? Why did God allow the tabernacle to be destroyed? Why did God allow Shiloh to be obliterated? Why? To protect his glory. His glory is more important than you having wins in life. That's true. You ever have been defeated in life? Where was God? Maybe God was the one who caused it because it wasn't for his glory. That's found all throughout the Bible. Read chapter 5. God did not need anybody from Israel's help in chapter 5. He did it all himself. Does God need Calvary Baptist Church? No. Does God need the Southern Baptist Convention? Does God need your money? Well, take it. <laughs> Does God need our programs, our campaigns, our slogans? No. Does he need America? No, he doesn't. All right, that's question one. I promise you, I'm speeding up. You ready? Question two. What happens when God's glory departs from his people? What do we expect when the glory is gone? Well, what happened to Israel? Number one, there was defeat. 
You read this in verse 10, and we'll read verse 10, and, and, and I'll, I will hurry, guys, okay? Verse 10. So the Philistines fought. Israel was defeated. <laughs> and Israel fled, every man to his home, and there was a great slaughter. 30,000 foot soldiers of Israel fell. Verse 11, the Ark of the Covenant was captured. Eli's two boys were killed. Israel was not tough enough or resourceful enough on his own to win. And that's true for us. We must have the presence of God to win. Number two, there is dread. It reads that every man fled to his own tent. Is it possible that in the coming days of persecution, and they are, and they are here, is it possible for church attendance to drop off even more then? Do you think people will stop coming because they're scared? Do you think preachers will quit preaching the full counsel of God because they don't want to go to prison? In my mind, hmm, dangerous place to be, but in my mind, I fully expect somebody my age or maybe younger to go to jail. I do believe that. I, I, I believe that in this country, not in North Korea, but here. I do believe that. There is death. Casualties galore. But what's worse in this scripture, what's worse than in the scripture, is not the physical deaths, but think about it, people. If the presence of God leaves Calvary, we damn people's souls to hell. Because God wants to use us to win the loss to Christ. But if we let God's spirit go, and we become Ichabod, that damns people not just physically, but spiritually. There's also despair. You read in verses 12 through 13, there's a runner who comes to tell the people of Shiloh before the Philistines come, we've lost, the Ark of the Covenant is gone, and the whole, whole community is crying out to God, and they're so sad. I have not read in the Bible one instance where a believer is in the presence of God or Jesus Christ, and they remain discouraged. Not in His presence, I have not. We need the presence of God. There is a deficit. Israel lost more than just a battle. Israel lost her place of worship. She, he. They were supposed to go worship corporately three times a year. With no tabernacle, no art, guess what? <laughs> Their corporate worship is done. And lastly, there is deterioration. The first battle, 4,000 souls were lost. Second battle, 30,000 souls. When we do things our own way and the presence of God leaves us, do you know that things do not get better? <laughs> things get prog progressively worse. If you think this culture is depraved, and you're right, it is. This is only the beginning. Do you remember Brother Van? For a year and a half, he went through the book of Revelation. It's going to get much worse. There's a deterioration when God's presence is not around. And I must close. Number three, what can we do to ensure that we have the presence of the Lord among us? What, can, what do we need at Calvary Baptist Church as individuals and as a body to say that Ichabod will not be written on our front doors? Well, look at what happened with Israel. You ready? And do the opposite. <laughs> what did Israel do wrong? All right, don't do that. So let me phrase it in a certain Baptist way. Number one, we need to be challenged. Israel was comfortable. I can promise you that if you are a challenged people, that God's presence is there. Because God loves to challenge his people. That's how we grow. Number two, we need to remain close. Israel's problem was that he was detached from the Spirit of God. And that's why he began to focus on the ark and the miracles and all the great past victories. Well, God was with us back then. So surely he'll be with us today. They drifted from God. For you not to be a casual Christian, you need to be close. And this is something that a friend of mine sent me today. I'm going to steal it. When you get closer to Jesus Christ, the crowd's going to be a lot smaller. I'm just telling you that. The closer Jesus walked to the cross, what happened to the number of his followers? And on the cross, he was alone. We need to be constant. Israel was cheating on God. How do we not cheat? We need to faithfully say every day to the Lord, I love you. 
The reason why my wife and I are still married after 20 plus years, Kim, is that right? <laughs> it's because I choose to love her as she chooses to love me daily. And some days for her is very difficult. <laughs> we need to be cautious. Israel was callous. He, he led anything through the door, these wicked people. My friend, we need to be careful who we, we need to be careful who we let stand behind the desk. We need to be careful who plays behind the piano, who sings the piano on stage, who plays the drums with or without shoes, <laughs> people who play the guitar, people who run the sound and the video, do the nursery, Awana Children's Church, youth, small group leaders. We need to be cautious in who we hire, not hire, but who we get to fill those positions. Amen? That's why you vote on those things. That's why you have people in the nominating committee who go out and find the people that God wants on these committees, whether they remember they were on it or not. <laughs> and lastly, we need to be centered. It goes back to this. <laughs> it goes back to this. If you're not centered on this, it's all going to fall apart. We need to be centered on the Word of God. Last thing I'm going to say, I'm going to shut up. Chances are when we do this, all right, everybody look now. Chances are when we do this, our numbers will decrease. Because not everybody wants to work. Sorry, it's true. Are you okay with our numbers dropping some? Are you okay with that? Is that most, more than likely is going to be a result of this? If we dedicate ourselves to do these things, to keep the presence of God with us. But I promise you, numbers drop, we get serious about God, they won't stay down long. Because God is faithful to himself. Amen or oh me. That's an amen. I hope you're glad to come. That was not a message. When I, I was writing it down, I said, Lord, I don't want to go over this tonight. But that's what he gave me. So that's what you get. We love you, Calvary. Your staff does love you. We pray for you. We do. Thank you for praying for us. I cannot tell you how many people tell me, Pete, we're praying for you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Together. Together, guys. Living stones becoming one. We are the rock. We are the rock. And the gates of hell cannot prevail against us. But we need his presence. We need his presence. Who's going to pray us out tonight? Do we have a mic, Bruce? I, I know I, I did not discuss this with you. It's over here. Who's praying us out tonight? Yes, sir. We've gone through the prayer request. Any, any questions or comments tonight? Who's ready to go home? You know you are. Who's praying for us? Is it Sam? Sam Bone. I'm putting you on the spot. You did a great job at Hope Night. Dear Lord, thank you for the message that you have sent us. It's the one that is somewhat hard to swallow and can step on a lot of toes. But it's one that's also that needs to be said in order to realize the truth of the Bible needs, does not need to be compromised. It does not need to be uh, less than what it actually is. For the glory of the Lord can always do anything. The glory of the Lord can always be with you. The glory of the Lord could be with multiple people at multiple times, all at the same time, and still heal everything. And thank you for our gathering, and thank you for all that you do for us. And thank you for the and thank you for all the wonderful people that do exist. And I hope with the Lord's prayer behind us that we do his will by casting ourselves into doing his work as he wants us to do yes. in order to save the lost souls. That's right. Amen. Thank you, Sam. Jesus' name. Guys, y'all have a great week. It's good seeing you.